Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, well, welcome to this winter tree identification workshop. Um, as I said, my name is Natalie Harmsworth, Centre Manager at the Wildlife Information Centre. So this morning, we'll be giving you an instru instruction to winter trees. Um, I'll cover um, the equipment you need and some useful books and resources um, that can help you with your identification and getting started. Uh, we'll look at the terminology that you need to know when using the keys. Um, and then we'll go through um, some of the common species that you can encounter in this part of Scotland. And then finally, the last about half an hour will be a demonstration um, of keen specimens uh, using the Field Studies Council, Council's ADAP guide. The so winter trees um, are a conspicuous part of our landscape. Um, in the summer, uh, we have the benefit of looking at um, leaves and flowers to identify them. But in the winter, we don't have um, that, uh, those features. So just to define at the outset what we're talking about by winter trees. So our focus really this morning will be um, those broad-leaved deciduous trees that lose their leaves um, in the autumn. So we're not talking about those conifers that lose their needles, um, such as the larches. Um, and we're also not including um, broadleaf species of tree that are evergreen, so retain uh, their leaves throughout the season. Uh, and we're also talking about um, species that are common in this part of Scotland principally, although of course many of these will be found elsewhere in the UK. So the adaption of um, being deciduous um, is really an adaption to climate and worldwide these species are found um, where there's a seasonal climate, where there's a distinctive growing season and this is all related to um, temperatures and frosts um, and other factors. So some of the features that you can see in winter um, include um, bark and colour and patterns can be useful when you're looking at identifying tree species. The overall form of the tree can be really useful as well, um, but it, it's not always reliable. So the form can vary depending on um, its situation. Um, so out in the open, it may have a broader form than in a woodland where it's competing with other trees. So in that sort of situation, you tend to get a much um, narrower form than when it's out in the open. Other features you can look for, of course, are seeds and fruits. Um, these can be really useful, but unfortunately they're not consistent. Um, so they're not consistently available um, throughout the winter period on all species, uh, which means that the keys tend not to focus on those. So what do we look at? Well, we're actually looking at the twigs and the buds, their colour, their form, their size, and particular details of the buds, such as the number of scales. So this is the feature that the keys principally rely on uh, when you're looking to name a tree. But it's worth re remembering these other features because they can provide additional evidence um, and pointers um, when you're looking at identification. So in terms of what equipment you need to get started, you don't need very much at all, actually. You need a times 10 or um, even better, a times 20 hand lens. Um, you need a ruler uh, because you need to measure certain features. A pair of binoculars is useful um, because the buds are not always at eye level um, and you may need to look up into the canopy for their arrangement, for example. If you're going to collect specimens, sepulchres are useful. Um, and for recording purposes, a notebook to note the details of um, the who, what, where and when. Um, and also um, taking a grid reference again for your tree. Um, so either using an OS map, um, a GPS device, 
Um, or if you've got a smartphone, there's um, some free apps you can use, such as OS Locate, which is which will give you a grid reference. For examining um, winter trees in or winter twigs in the at home, I find a lit hand lens is really useful. Um, it just really helps to make those small features um, clearer. So if you're having to count um, scales on an oak bud, for example, that's really helpful. Or if you're looking for small, much smaller details, hairs, etc., I just find a lit hand lens um, really helps with that. So now you've got your equipment, um, you need a good ID guide. Um, these are the two that I recommend for beginners, people starting out. Both Field Study Council guides. Um, the one on the left is a photographic guide. Um, and that's perhaps better if you have no prior experience. Um, but it, the one on the right is perhaps the one I would recommend because it includes a key um, and it also includes more species um, than the photographic guide. So if you don't know what the specimen is, it's really useful to be able to go through the process of keying it out um, before you refer to perhaps another book um, to collaborate um, to, to, to determine whether your identification has been correct. If you get into winter trees a bit more, um, really Poland, the book on the left is the best book for you because that's really comprehensive. It covers over 400 species um, that you're likely to find in the UK, Britain and Ireland. And it also has colour plates of the twigs, um, beautiful colour plates as well. Um, it is set out as a key. Again, it's a different type of key um, to the Field Study Council guide. So. Bernard Schultz's book centre um, is absolutely beautiful. Um, the illustrations are fantastic. Um, it's a bit of a large book though, so it's not really a field guide, um, but it'd be great as a reference um, at home and for interest, general interest. It's also not specific to the UK, so it covers um, all temperate um, deciduous species um, worldwide. And finally, don't forget your more generic tree books um, when you're looking at winter trees. Yes, okay, they'll focus in on leaves and fruits, etc. But they do have um, useful sections on buds usually, and also bark. Um, so I would recommend um, having that on hand as well. And whenever you get start to look at a new um, group, um, it's always useful to remember to re uh, look at existing data. So in this country, we have a fantastic um, natural history, um, um, natural history um, knowledge, um, and all this data um, is collated um, and is accessible. And these are two of the online resources that you can use um, to search for different um, organisms, not just trees, so the MBN Atlas uh, Scotland, um, there is also an MBN Atlas for the uh, UK. You can search for um, your tree and you'll get a distribution map of where it's found. So this is useful because it allows you to common sense check if you found something in the field, is it likely that you're, um, you should be seeing it where you are? The, the resource on the left is also really useful. This is um, the online atlas of British and Irish flora, and it links to the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland's um, data set. Um, so if you look on the slide on the left, you'll see there's a link which says linked interactive map, and that will take you to up-to-date data on all plants as well as trees. So if you were to use um, the online atlas on the left, say I searched for field maple, um, this is what you would see um, for this part of Scotland, southeast central Scotland. Um, and each of these squares relates to presence records for the field maple, um, with the green squares being the most recent sightings. So it really gives you an overview of where you're likely to see 
from different trees. Now you've got your resources sorted, um, let's look at some of the twig terminology that you need to know, um, particularly if you're going to use a key to determine the specimen. So the first thing to note um, is that when we're keying out specimens, we're looking at the tip of the twig. Um, so the first year shoot, this is what is used in the keys. In terms of the pots of the twig, um, we have um, a number of buds, and these are known as nodes. So this is where the new shoot uh, flowers or leaves will arise. Uh, the portion of the stem between two nodes or buds is termed the internode. Um, that can be useful because the internode length can vary, so that can be handy for some identification. The bud at the tip of the twig is known as the terminal bud, um, and those along the side of the shoot are referred to as the lateral buds. Um, beneath each bud, you'll find a scar. Um, this is a leaf scar. So this is where in the autumn the leaf falls off um, and it leaves a mark uh, where the petiole, so the stalk of the leaf, was attached to the twig. And the leaf scar can actually vary quite a lot in size and in uh, shape. So if you have a larger leaves or a compound leaf, like an ash or a rowan, um, the leaf scar is liable to be larger because the leaf is larger. Other scars you can find on the twig are, um, are bud scale scars. Um, and you can see this um, down here. Uh, so if I move on to the next slide, you can see bud scales a bit clearer. So on the left hand side, we have a sycamore uh, twig and each of these um, scales, bud scales, uh, would, would leave a scar once they fall off. So the bud scales really are there to protect the growing uh, bud. Um, so it protects it from uh, viruses, diseases, but it also protects it from um, insects that might like to feed on the um, new bud. So they're really there until the leaves emerge um, in the spring. Not all trees have bud scales, however. Um, so you do get some that are effectively um, naked, like this, this um, species on the right here. So you can see effectively all you have is the new um, folded leaf. So it's not protected by anything in this instance. So that's fairly unusual. So most trees have bud scales. So when it comes to identifying um, trees, um, looking at the twigs and the buds, um, a key thing that you'll need to look at in the first instance is how the buds are arranged on the twig. So are they in opposite pairs, um, such as on the left here? Um, are they the zigzagging, diagonally up the twig, so alternate arrangement? Um, or are they spiraling, circling around the twig, um, as in on the right here? Spiral is quite similar to alternate, and don't worry if um, initially you're not quite sure which it is. Um, the keys actually lump these together initially. Uh, but the key difference is with alternate, you can see they're side to side, the buds um, zigzag. Whereas in spiral, yes, they start off zigzagging, but you can see there's a bud tucked behind um, the twig here. And the further up, the third bud from the top is actually on the face. And so you can see actually it's not strictly zigzag, it's, it's spiraling around the twig. So that's the difference between the three bud arrangements. So we're going to make a start now on looking at species with opposite buds. So that's um, trees with buds in pairs. 
like this. So the first of these is the dogwood, um, which is more of a shrub than a tree. Um, and it's quite conspicuous this time of year because it's got these lovely blood red uh, twigs. Um, and for this reason, it's um, beloved by gardeners. Um, so you will get, um, you need to be aware of that there are many cultivated dogwoods as well, um, not just the native dogwood. So that's something to watch out for. And you get them in different colors as well, oranges and greens as well. But this, the standard dogwood um, would look, the buds would look like this. You can see that these, this is an example of a species with naked buds. Um, and you can see the lateral buds on the, in the center image um, in pairs, and then the terminal bud on the right. Uh, the next species with um, opposite buds I want to show you is the elder. This is perhaps one of my favorite um, trees to look at, small shrub or tree. Um, but the twigs and the buds are quite distinctive. So the twigs are, can look a bit corky when they're young. Um, and you have these raised um, wart-like structures. These are lentor cells or breathing pores. Um, and then the buds themselves are quite unusual. Um, so they do have um, scales covering um, the bud, but they're quite um, ragged looking. Um, some people describe them as um, resembling a pineapple in shape, um, but there's lovely purple color um, as well. And at this time of year, you'll see that the, the leaves may have started already um, shooting. So it's a species that comes into leaf very early in the season. Um, you'll also be familiar with elder, of course, because it has those lovely panicles of white flowers in the summer, um, and of course the black elder breeze um, in the autumn. Another distinctive species is the ash. Um, so if you remember ash black buds, that helps you remember this species. Very few scales covering um, the buds in this case, <clears throat> but in opposite pairs again on the twig. And the twig um, color contrasts quite um, significantly against the black buds. So it's this sort of pale gray color and very smooth looking. And this is a species with large composite leaves. And you can see that the leaf spar is likewise quite large. Um, a sort of oval, um, not oval, um, crescent shaped. And quite often ash retains um, its keys or its seeds over the winter. So you will see them on the tree quite often this time of year. Another species that you should be familiar with is the horse chestnut. Um, which has perhaps one of the largest um, buds that you're likely to see here. So they can be up to three centimeters long. But the key thing about these are they're sticky. Um, and the leaf scars are also very conspicuous, um, resembling a shield with these raised dots around the edge or a horseshoe. Some people think of them as horseshoes. Um, conkers, of course, you may see at this time of year. Um, the leftovers uh, from the autumn around the base of the tree. Now we're now going to move on to three maples. Um, so the field maple, the sycamore and the Norway maple. Um, the keys separate out field maple first on account of it having hairy buds. So sycamore and Norway maple are hairless. Um, or only have hairs around um, the edges of the scales. In field maple, the whole surface has this sort of white appearance. Field maple buds are also smaller than sycamore in Norway maple, so about half a centimetre long, um, and they're dark, um, sort of browny black colour. 
I've also included the fruits for reference. Um, so in field maple, you can see they're almost um, in just in a line almost. And if we then compare that to sycamore and Norway maple fruits, um, you can see that sycamore are more sort of acute um, and Norway maple are wider sort of 90 degrees or so. In terms of the buds of these, Sycamore and Norway maple are fairly similar size buds, um, both again in opposite pairs. Um, the colour is perhaps the most um, initially obvious um, difference, although you need to be a bit careful with the colour because I have seen um, Norway maple can have slightly greenish buds if it's in deep shade. Um, so you need to be slightly careful with that one. Um, but the twig colour also differs. So Norway maple twigs are sort of brownish, um, whereas in sycamore they're more grey colour. Uh, other features you, that you can use to distinguish between them. Um, if you look at the lateral buds, so the side buds, um, in sycamore, uh, they're pointing away from the shoot. Whereas in the Norway maple, um, the lateral buds you see on the far left, a uh, far right, sorry, um, they're actually pressed up against the twig, um, what we call ad pressed. So if you're a bit unsure, if you think the colour's not quite, um, it doesn't look quite right, you know, it's sort of, it's not properly red, it's not properly green. Now have a look at the lateral side buds and these other features, and that should sort you out. But typically, sycamore have green buds with this sort of red edge to them, and Norway maple will be red. So that finishes the common species with opposite buds. We'll now move on to those with alternate buds. The first of these I'd like to show you is the lime. Um, this is another very attractive um, red, ready colour twigs. There's actually three species of lime in this part of Scotland. So we have the common lime, and the large leaf lime, and the small leaf lime. Um, the common lime is actually a hybrid uh, between the other two, which should give you an indication that identification might be not entirely straightforward for me. However, all three have these quite zigzaggy arrangement of twigs, red buds that kind of resemble boxing gloves, so very few scales. With lines, um, the sunny side of the twigs will often be red, but if it's in shade, um, it will, the, the twig will often be green on the underside, um, as you can see in the image on the right. Common lime is perhaps the most easy of the three to tell apart. Um, <clears throat> the characters you want to look for, um, at the base of the trunk, uh, there'll be lots of shoots, so abundant epicormic shoots, as you can see in the center picture. So these are really new, um, new growths, but they're, instead of being, as they usually are, um, a branched, um, growth form. They're on actually coming out of the trunk itself, um, and often it's, it's a mass of them, as you can see here. So this feature is um, typical of where you have common line. They also often have burrs, so these uh, growths on the trunk and sort of nobbles. That's also typical of common lime. And finally, one other feature that can be useful to tell it apart from uh, small leaved and large leaved lime is the internode length. So the gap between two buds. In the common lime, the internode length is much longer than the other two lines. So here, um, five to 10 centimeters. 
in the small leaf lime and large leaf lime, it can be um, anything from half a centimetre up to four centimetres. So that can be quite useful. And if you use the ADAP key, you'll see that the, um, the size of the buds is another feature to tell them apart. So as you might expect, small leaf lime would have smaller buds um, than common and large leaf limes. So we now move on to um, those species with clustered buds. So usually when you look at a twig, you might have one or two buds um, along the side shoots and at the tip. But in oaks and cherries, they have clustered buds. And the position of these clusters is key to uh, determining whether you've got oak or cherry. So if the clusters occur on the side shoots and you have uh, maybe one or two buds at the tip, you've got a cherry. Whereas if your clustered buds occur at the termin terminal, uh, at the tip of the shoot, um, the terminal buds, um, you've got an oak. But in other respects, you can see that they, they look very similar. Another handy thing, I think, with cherries and oaks is actually to look at the bark. So cherry, cherries bark have these lovely um, longitudinal, um, is it called lenticels again? Um, these sort of lines, longitudinal lines on the trunk. We don't get that with oak, so it looks more, in a mature specimen, it's, it's more fissured. Um, and these um, sort of plates are more horizontal than vert um, sorry, vertical than horizontal, as in the cherry. So you can see straight away the difference there. So I think that's quite useful as well. Uh, but returning to the buds, um, these cluster buds are visible even from a distance. So if you've got the twigs silhouetted against the sky, you can quite clearly see these clusters on the side shoots. And this particular one is wild cherry, so Prunus avium. So cherries, um, I've grouped them all together because there are a lot of ornamental species out there. Um, so if you can get it to cherry, that's a good first step. Um, and then perhaps use your ID guide. You probably need Poland for this um, to determine which cherry you've got. So on the oaks, um, we've got two, two main species um, that are reliable to come across, so English oak and sessile oak. Um, there's also a hybrid to be aware of. Um, so if your specimen doesn't quite fit or has a mix of characters, it's quite possible if you're looking at a hybrid. Uh, but the way to tell apart the two species really is to look at the bud scales. And for this, you're definitely going to need your hand lens because you're going to need to count the scales and decide if you've got more than 20 or less than 20 scales. Um, and when you're counting scales, you don't want to just look at one bud and count them and say, oh, I've got 19, so I must have English oak. Look at several buds um, and get a sort of average um, before you make a decision. Hairiness can also help. So in sessile oak, uh, they're hairless, whereas in English oak, they're hairy. And you may have acorns as well to help you, so that can give you another clue. So we'll move on to the beach. So we're still on the alternate twigs, alternate buds. Uh, in this species, the buds are very long and slender, and they have a large number of scales. They're sort of brownish color, torpedo shaped. Um, and one of the ways when I was first getting to grips with botany, um, and I wanted to remember the Latin name for beach was Fagus sylvatica. Uh, my tutors told me, Fagus, think of fag. So the buds are fag shaped, you know, cigarette shaped. 
that's a good way to remember the genus name was Fagus. And coincidentally, Sylvatica, so the other Latin name, um, this, which makes up the specific name for this tree, Sylvatica means of the woods. Um, so it's quite appropriate. In terms of the bark, it's um, grey and smooth. And you'll find these fruits um, on beach masks um, during the winter time as well. So that's another quite distinctive feature if it's present. So we'll now look at the birches, silver birch and downy birch. Again, I'm afraid there is a hybrid, um, so you can get a mix of characters on some specimens. But in terms of um, what these two should look like, growth form here can be useful. So the general outline of the tree. Um, in silver birch, you have pendulous drooping uh, shoots, whereas downy birch tends to be not so drooping. Um, the bark can help. So in a more mature specimen, silver birch develops these um, sort of diamond shaped fissures on a silvery white backdrop. Um, whereas downy birch doesn't really uh, peel quite so much. So it just looks more um, silvery. It doesn't really develop these markings to this extent. Um, if you get close up to the tree and look at the buds, um, in silver birch, um, the twigs should be hairless and warty. Uh, whereas in downy birch, as the name suggests, it should have this covering of short hairs so down on the twigs um, and should be lacking warts. So that's really what you're looking for. Um, you need to be slightly careful with silver birch in that um, young um, saplings can have hairy shoots. So that's something to look out for. Um, but if you've got a mature specimen, these, these are the characters you're looking for. And if it has a mix, then I would conclude it's probably a hybrid. So hazel is perhaps another one of my favorites. Um, lovely little green buds that perhaps resemble raisins. Um, and if you look at the shoot in general, um, in, in detail, get your hand lens out, um, you'll see that the hairs have little red gland tips to them. So you can have a look at that. This species also has catkins before the leaves come out. And so you can look for those sort of um, February time onwards, I would say. And the female flowers, so that is uh, these tiny little red flowers are also delightful, and, but tiny, so only less than half a centimetre long, about the same size as the buds. So you can look for those as well. Hazel is traditionally coppiced, and so you may find it as a sort of shrub growth rather than a tree, a small tree. And the final one I want to look at in terms of um, alternate arrangement is the witch elm. These have really tiny buds, um, so half a centimetre long, really dark. Um, and again, if you get your hand lens out and look at the hairs, um, you'll see that there's hairs along the edges of the scales. Um, these are known as ciliate hairs. Um, and really just think of them as eyelashes. Um, and you won't go far wrong. So it's got like this row of hairs. But there's also some rusty color hairs on there. There, other, there are other elms that you might encounter. So the English elm, for example, very similar, so quite tricky. Um, but one of the features you can look for is if it has, um, if it's showing signs of suckering. So that's where shoots arise from the roots from around the base of the plant. And it can be some distance away from the trunk or the main stem 
if you've got evidence of suckering, it's not a witch elm, it's liable to be uh, an English elm. But in other respects, the twigs look very similar. And finally, we want to look at a couple of um, species with spiral buds. The most typical group is actually the willows and um, for the salix species. There are many willows and they're quite a tricky group, group so I've, I'm going to just lump them together here. Um, the characters are, so you can see it's spiraling around the twig, the buds, but the buds are often lying quite flat against the twig, so they're depressed. And that's also very typical of willows. The other species with um, spiraling buds is the older. Um, and this tree is found on riverbanks in damp places typically. Um, and the interesting thing about older is the buds are stalked. So all the buds I've showed you so far really have been sat directly attached directly to the twigs, whereas these have a stalk. And these are described as club shaped. So I think of Fred Flintstone when I think of older, because it's, it's like one of those Stone Age clubs. Um, the colour's very attractive as well in older. It's sort of this purplish grey colour. The twigs are quite rough. Um, with the lenticels, cells, these little dots uh, visible. Um, and of course, older will often have cones. So these are the female um, fruits. And you can see the catkins, so the male, the male flowers developing. There are a couple of introduced olders to be aware of. So the gray older and the Italian older. Uh, the cones can be used for the Italian older because they're about double the size of older. So that's really handy if you've got cones. With grey older, um, you need to look at the shoot tips and see if they're downy, hairy. If they are, um, it's going to be grey older rather than the ordinary older. You're most likely to come across grey older or Italian older um, in places. Uh, near habitation, um, so in your towns and villages where they've clearly been planted, um, whereas in wilder places you're more likely to come across the native um, older. So I hope you've seen that buds are both variable and beautiful um, and can be used with a bit of practice to tell the uh, different tree species apart. Um, we've done really done a whistle stop tour of some of the common species you're likely to encounter. There are many other species as well, uh, particularly in urban settings, parks and gardens. I would give you some general advice if you're wanting to look at winter trees. Um, if you wanna make your life easy, I would go somewhere quite semi-natural. So, uh, maybe woodlands along riversides, um, because that will limit the number of different tree species you're likely to encounter. So you can really get to grips with those common species first um, before branching out into um, more um, specimens. However, on the other side of the coin, um, if you want to expose yourself to as many different species as possible, I would suggest going to a botanical gardens or arboretum. So the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, or um, Doik Botanic Gardens and Scottish Borders would be really good places to visit just to see a wide range of specimens and very often they're labelled as well so you can test yourself, take your book with you and then uh, see if you get it right. Recording is also a key part of what we do. Um, so do take time to record trees um, in wilder places, um, so outside parks and gardens and submit your records. There's guidance on recording on our website. Um, you can also use the online recording system iRecord. Um, those are shared with the recording scheme and TWIP. Um, 
And if you're really keen to develop your plant ID skills, I'd recommend um, checking out the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. Um, they have loads of useful resources on their website, and they also um, organise excursions and training, um, field training. So they would be a brilliant place to go for more information. So what we'll do now is we'll take, we'll have uh, about 10 minutes for questions um, before we move on to having a look at some real specimens and cleaning them out. So thank you very much.